wanted to, on behalf of the Teaneck Chamber of Commerce, our partner organizations, I wanted to thank everybody for coming on uh, this evening's program. My name is Jennifer Glass, the Vice President of the Teaneck Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to introduce you to our uh, moderator for this evening, Pat Saparito from SCORE. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and uh, welcome um, everyone. I guess I'm going to do introducing myself um, first, um, and just a little bit about SCORE if, you, um, if you're not aware of SCORE. So I'm a mentor with the Northeast New Jersey SCORE chapter. SCORE is a national nonprofit providing free confidential mentoring and training to small business owners. We are funded by the SBA. The Northeast New Jersey chapter serves businesses in Bergen and Passaic counties and partners with other nonprofits such as the SBDC, the Chambers of Commerce, and other city and county agencies. I'm also a small business owner. I provide data and analytics consulting and training, and I'm the author of the book Applied Insurance Analytics. I mentor InsureTech startups, and I'm on the advisory board at Stevens Institute of Technology for their data and analytics master's program. And I'd like to make a few opening uh, comments. Um, just as we, we thought we were beginning to adapt to the new normal, we've been hit by a resurgence of cases. And if we learn nothing else, it's to expect the unexpected and to be ready to adapt. On the good news front, both the Senate and the House approved a bill to extend the deadline for the PPP loan apps five weeks to August the 5th, it's awaiting signature now by the president. And there is 129 million uh, left in the program. There is more good news, and we'll hear shortly from Joanne about the Bergen County grants for non-essential businesses. But let me first introduce um, our panel. Let me go through their, their bios. <clears throat> Lynn Elgrant is the Vice President of Planning, Development, and Communications at Greater Bergen. Most recently, she was the Chief Executive Officer of the Bergen Volunteer Center. In 2017, she was named one of the 17 people to watch by the Bergen Record and NorthJersey.com. In 2020, February 2020, she was awarded the Community Service by the County Executive, Board of Chosen Freeholders, and the Bergen County African American Advisory Committee. Lynn served as a council member at large for the city of Englewood, New Jersey, and was elected by her peers to serve as the council president. I'll let Lynn maybe talk a little bit more about the rest of her background later. <clears throat> let me now introduce James. James Brown is managing partner of James D. Brown CPA, a full service accounting and consulting firm based in Teaneck, New Jersey, which specializes in providing tax preparation and planning, accounting, business management and consulting for small businesses and high net worth individuals. James served on the board of directors of the National Association of Black Accountants for 11 years, and he's had held other um, uh, senior executive and board positions within ABA. He's also a member of the American Institute of CPAs, the New Jersey Society of CPAs, and the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. And I was teasing a bit earlier, he holds a number of professional um, designations, which I won't go into reading, but it's, it's very impressive. He's been a featured speaker for several businesses and in, in, in civic organizations. Joanne Similica is the director of the Bergen County Division of Economic Development, working under the leadership of the county executive, James Tedesco III, and the Board of Chosen Freeholders to attract, retain, and expand businesses and jobs utilizing local, county, and state assets and partnerships. The Division of Economic Development works closely with municipalities, chambers of commerce, commercial real estate firms, developers, and other groups to further and strengthen the economy in Bergen County. <clears throat> Jennifer Glass is CEO at Business Growth Strategies International. BGSI provides a robust and best-in-class solution for business owners looking to grow their businesses and revenues. Ms. Glass is frequently asked to speak on numerous stages. She recently co-authored Reach Your Greatness with ABC secret millionaire James Malinchek and has her book, It's the Bottom Line That Matters, Quick Tips and Strategies You Can Use Right Now to Grow Your Business in the Next 12 Months. She's been featured in numerous media outlets, including ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox, recognized as a leader in business by more than a thousand organizations and the Small Business Development Center. 
and as noted, she's vice president of the, of the TNAC chamber. Eugene Sportsman is AVP of head and head of government affairs, leading the public policy and advocacy efforts within the Office of Public Affairs at Cross River. He represents the bank at the local, state, and federal levels of government. Eugene started his career in government in the Office of Assemblyman Goldfeder and as a community liaison, ultimately becoming chief of staff. He's managed a number of campaigns in New York State, ranging from the city council to the state senate and assembly. Eugene is the driving force behind Cross River strategic partnerships and, and government advocacy efforts. Fernando Sosa is the managing partner of the cybersecurity and IT support firm called HeyOnTech.com, and I apologize, I probably murdered that, Fernando. They help small businesses, healthcare practices, and nonprofits leverage technology. He is on the board of the TNAC Chamber and an active participant at various local community groups and organizations. And last but not least, Vincent Vicari is the regional director of the New Jersey Small Business Development Center in Bergen County. It is, which is located or hosted rather at Abramopo College of New Jersey. Vince is an award-winning published author on small business and entrepreneurship with articles appearing in peer-reviewed journals. He's been recognized as a nationally leading professional figure in support of small business as a recipient of America's Small Business Development Center State Star in 2017. In addition to his work with the New Jersey SBDC, He's empowered the business community through showing his leadership on various boards. He's a member of the Bergen County Workforce Development Board, and he previously served as chairman of the board of the Gold Coast, Coast Regional Chamber of Commerce. It's a pretty august uh, panel, and I'm thrilled to be uh, able to moderate and work with them all. So, Joanne, okay, let's hand it over to that. you. Mm -hmm. If I can just interject for one second. Sure, Jennifer. Um, for those of you that are on the program, should you have any questions during the course of the program, please put them in the chat. Um, I will get them and we will have uh, those questions asked of you, um, of yeah. the panel, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, whatever wire. questions you guys just do have. So please get those Okay. Ready, Jennifer? Are we good? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So, Joanne, let's turn it over to you. We are excited to hear about this new program. Yes. Thank you, Pat. And thank you to the TNIC Chamber, Jennifer, Larry, and all the panelists that are on with me today. Um, I want to start the program off with a little bit of good news, if I may, and uh, report that on behalf of the County Executive, Jim Tedesco, the Board of Children Freeholders, in addition to our amazing partners like the SBDC at Ramapo College, SCORE, and every Chamber of Commerce basically in Bergen County itself, we are launching the Bergen County Cares Small Business Program. Um, it's going to start to be announced as of Monday, July 6th, but there is information that I could give you today on the program and also um, a landing page on a website where you can go and find out more about the grant. Um, it is going to be July 13th to July 24th, so that's not that far away. It's about two weeks, and we wanted to give businesses the opportunity to get uh, the documentation that will be needed. I'm sure a lot of the businesses that are on this call today, uh, this isn't your first run. You've been, you know, applying to a lot of different uh, grant programs, and hopefully you've gotten a lot of different grant programs, and you're doing your best to stay afloat. Um, okay. I'm hoping that this one at the county can also supplement and add to what you need to, you know, get through this pandemic. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the companies that we, or I should say the county executive really, was looking to help. So there was a, um, an executive order, as everybody knows, by Governor Murphy back in March 16th. I think it was number 104. And really what that executive order did was say to the essential businesses, uh, you know, you are allowed to still be open, but the non-essential businesses like the downtown stores, mostly Main Street stores, uh, retail and tanning salons and hair salons and uh, small gyms or medium gyms, but anything that was on that list deemed 
non-essential, and it was, like I said, Executive Order 104, the county executive really wanted to help them because they really had absolutely no ability whatsoever to remain open. It's not that that's the only group that we're going to be um, including in this grant, but it really is the first and foremost because these folks had really the least amount of shock at this. So that's going to be um, really what we're looking at right now. In addition to the non-essential businesses that were uh, asked to close by Governor Murphy, we're also looking at home-based businesses, uh, LLCs and LOPs, uh, corp and S corp, um, and sole proprietors, so home-based businesses as well. The eligibility really of the of the program is going to be anybody with between one and 19 employees. So if you have 19 or fewer, you are going to be eligible for this particular business. And again, if you are one of those non-essential businesses that was ordered to shut down or your home-based businesses, you certainly can apply. Now, the, the, the meat and potatoes, I should say, of the grants is it's going to provide up to $10,000 in financial assistance. And each qualified applicant is going to be based on uh, who, who qualifies, I should say. The grant amount is going to be based on three months of rent, business property mortgage and utility expenses, or up to 10K, as we said. So this is really a way for the county to help those who have had to shut their lights off and maybe had a little bit of a problem or a struggle paying some rent or utility bills. This is you know, hopefully going to reimburse or help even pay. Um, and hopefully, like I said, whoever's on this call right now will um, be able to apply on the 13th. I'm going to obviously give a, a, a website that I want you to go to. Um, and also, if you have questions about the grant, I'm going to give that as well. But I'd also like at the end, I think, Jennifer, you're going to have my contact information. I want anybody that's on this call to please call me and I will handhold and walk through no matter what, because if you fit this eligibility and and you deserve this grant. So the county website where you'll be able to find information on the grant is bergencountycares.org. So again, that's bergencountycares.org. If you have any questions on the grant and eligibility, even after you've gone to bergencountycares.org. This is a big one, so write it down if you don't mind. And Jen, maybe you could shoot it out afterwards, but it's-, it's in the chat. Perfect, okay. So the email for questions will be bergencountycares at co.bergen.nj.us. So there's sort of two avenues there that could have you sort of get a head start. Come Monday, we're going to be working with our partners, the SBDC, who is relentlessly helping businesses tirelessly day and night. If, if anybody that's listening on this call is not registered with the SBDC and hasn't had the opportunity or pleasure, I should say, to work with Vince Picari, who's on this, please do so right now. If you do something at the end of this webinar, go to the SBDC website and sign up and meet Vince because he truly is a warrior. Score as well. And the chambers, I have to say, there are a magnificent amount of chambers in Bergen County, each one of them reaching out to us saying, how could we help? What can we do? We have Main Street folks that are in dire need of assistance. Is there anything that could happen? And to be quite honest, that's what the county executive was listening to. He had his ear to the ground and said, what is the real thing going on out there? So we didn't really sort of choose to do, you know, these businesses from nowhere. It was from listening and hearing and taking polls and surveys and saying, what is the big need? So our chambers of commerce are so key. And if you belong to a chamber of commerce, please partner with them on this grant because come Monday we're going to be reaching out to every chamber head giving them all the materials as well so that they know I want everybody to know what it's going to look like what it's going to entail because on the 13th when you have the opportunity online I want you to have the documents that are necessary and be able to upload them answer the questions and hopefully get the grant and that's really the the gist of the program but please please reach out to me at the uh, contact info. At the, I think it's at the end of this, um, and and you know, call me, and we can certainly talk, and I'll walk you through it as best as I possibly can. And again, the chambers are terrific. Uh, Vince Bakari from uh, SBDC and Kathleen, his partner, and Score is amazing. So you've got so many terrific advocates here. I'm so honored to be on this panel with these folks, and you're going to hear so much more from them. But I really wanted to start this off because I feel like it is a little bit of good news, and I hope everybody on here gets it. So. Good luck to you. Reach out with any questions. I'm here. Thanks so much, Joanne. That's really exciting. The program sounds fabulous. Uh, just a quick question, and it may not apply, but I'll ask the question anyway. 
Um, does it apply for nonprofits or is it only for for profit firms? We are look, talking to nonprofits. There is a separate uh, funding source that we are looking at through community development. So I do encourage nonprofits to apply. They're not particularly in the first uh, eligibility bucket, but they are going to be helped. We are going to be routing them to the sources that can give them some aid. Great. Thanks so much. Um, well, as we're waiting, so just remind everyone, if you have questions, um, please um, s submit them through the, um, through the chat um, function. And um, what we'll do in the meantime is I have some questions that we're going to ask the panel. We're going to rotate around and um, get their input. So um, a couple of questions um, for them. What, and, um, and I'll, I'll post the question, then I'll go around and call your name and ask you to please weigh in. Um, what are one of the most challenging client situations that you faced? So some of you, some of us are agencies, right? Nonprofits helping uh, clients. Others of you are, um, uh, are small businesses yourselves on the panel, and clearly you have clients that you're helping. So what, what are one of the um, most challenging client situations that you had, and how were you able to help your client adapt to it? And um, why don't I start out with you, Lynn? I'm going to go alphabetically, so or maybe I'll go <laughs> uh, in the, the I'll mix it up a little bit later. But Lynn, I'm going to hit you first. So, um, as a nonprofit organization that runs uh, direct service programs, um, and, and first of all, let me just say I'm so honored to be on this panel, and thank you guys for inviting me. Um, I hope I can be helpful. Um, we deal with a lot of senior citizens, a lot of low income families in our direct service um, work. And so clearly just insecurity issues uh, were foremost and front line for, for them in the early days of the, uh, of the pandemic and the shutdown. You know, how do I get food if I can't get out, if it's not safe for me to get out, those kinds of questions. Um, I think now we're beginning to see our other clientele, quite honestly, is non other nonprofit organizations. We're actually a membership organization. We invite other nonprofits to list volunteer opportunities in our database, and we do work with other nonprofits. So one of the things that we organized about, uh, I guess, two or three weeks ago we happened through the Meadowlands Chamber of Commerce to connect with somebody who could, who knew how to get PPE, right? And most of us, I think, were afraid to even figure out how to order it because we didn't want to pull resources away from the frontline people who needed it, but we didn't know how to acquire it or buy it. And so through that relationship with somebody from the Meadowlands Chamber, we built a coalition of nonprofit organizations to think about our PPE needs through the end of the year. And, um, and then we're able to bulk purchase. So we had buying power much like larger entities. Um, so I'm really proud of that. But those are the kinds of things that we're all wrestling with. Like, do you need masks and gloves in order to be opened up? And, and like any business, right, you might need it for your employees. We might need it for our volunteers. We might need it for our clients. And so we built a coalition of 15 uh, nonprofits and we bulk purchased PPE at a really good rate. That's perfect, Lynn. And I'm going to try and keep it moving because we want to make sure they're of course. Sorry. But Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to mix it up, uh, James. I'm going over to you. Okay. Circle gets the square, huh? There you go. <laughs> so I guess the most challenging situation I had started kind of before COVID-19, but definitely uh, COVID-19 made it that much more challenging. So I had a, a client, uh, it was a relatively new client, took them on last year. It's, it's a, a pest control company, extermination, so forth. Uh, for some reason known only to God, I guess, their accountant moved from New Jersey to South Dakota. Yes. Only the second person that I know that's ever made such a move. <laughs> and anyway, they lost contact with them. So they reached out to me. So I, I caught them up for 2018. And then they, they kind of disappeared. They were having issues. They, they were struggling uh, financially anyway. 
And then of course I get an urgent call and it was an accounting emergency as I call it. Uh, the owner was actually uh, filing for bankruptcy. So he needed tax returns for the business and, and his personal return. It was, it was a family owned business. It was a husband and wife and they, their son actually works at, you know, as a, a driver or what have you. So I rushed and caught them up for 2019. I actually had to reconstruct 2018 because the wife decided that QuickBooks Online didn't work for her. So we had converted. And so she went back to using desktop, but that's too much. That's TMI, I guess. So anyway, <laughs> uh, got, the, got everything caught up uh, for the bankruptcy hearing, sent them a bill, which, which I knew at that point had uh, two chances of getting paid, at least in a timely manner, uh, slim and none, as they say. Uh, and then COVID hit. So I'm talking to them and they, they uh, service a lot of school districts. So all the schools were closed down. So, you know, as I said, they were already struggling and now, you know, their revenue stream was, was next to zero. Then, both husband and wife came down with the virus. And how did you help them, James? So, you know, I'm trying well, to figure out how you helped them. Let's get to the chase here. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, basically I, I, I helped them uh, get, get through um, the bankruptcy filing and also catching them up because the wife actually did, uh, she did like all of the billing and, um, the bank reconciliation and recording the deposits in the bank. So I continued to help them almost as kind of like a staff accountant. Uh, and then sadly, uh, the wife died. So, you know, I've, I've still been working with them and, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're running on a, a, on a shoestring really now and, and actually a shoestring budget, which means I'm not getting paid. So I, I've still, you know, they were very, very likable couple. <laughs> the, I mean, the, yeah. the husband's like in his 70s, the wife was in her 60s. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying not to abandon them, although I don't, uh, yeah. I don't like to do a lot of charity work, although okay. I, I do wind up uh, doing it quite a bit. And uh, well, so, so hopefully at some point, go one ahead. One in the ledger for you, James. One in the good side of the ledger for you. I'm sure there's others. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me, we have a question. So, you know, I'm going to break it up a little bit. Um, I see a question um, out here. Um, let's see, from any funding to help um, small businesses, uh, small businesses uh, rent for the times they could not be open. Well, you already, if you were listening, I'm sorry, you might have joined late, but you may have heard what Joanne just shared. So depending, it doesn't say what your business is, whether you're essential or non-essential, but that may be one avenue for you. Um, and then um, somebody, the same person was asking maybe about where you could apply for gloves or masks. So if anyone, we can uh, take a look at that. Lynn, maybe if you know, uh, you can uh, share that information uh, later, perhaps. We'll put, a, sure. we'll put together a frequently asked questions list at the end of this. So if we don't necessarily ask your question, answer your question during the stream, we will come back and make sure that some of those answers get posted. Great, uh, Thank Thanks. you for the questions. Um, so um, I'd like to take that same, uh, maybe that same question. Um, Fernando, you know, IT, right? Um, one of the, <laughs> <laughs> was one of the big, Big areas, IT, right? IT, right. <laughs> we're all living, you know, uh, we're all Zoom fatigued, although apparently not everyone is Zoom fatigued because we're all here. <laughs> but, uh, but clearly people needed to, uh, you know, to move quickly and nobody more so. I know that a big part of your, uh, your client uh, base is obviously um, healthcare practices, right? Um, yes. As, uh, well, you know, certainly many of them had gone for electronic medical records. I'm not so sure all of them were hooked up for telemedicine, although they pretty much seem to be now. So could you share a little bit about, um, you know, what, what were some of the more, most one of the challenging client situations you ran into from a technology perspective and how were you able to help them? Sure. Uh, well, the obvious uh, 
issue, the uh, challenge was the rush to work from home and having, uh, helping uh, the, my clients that weren't already set up to work from home, work from home quickly. Uh, so that was, that was the biggest challenge. And it was, it was, a uh, it was a big rush and not, and it didn't just, it didn't just impact or, or it wasn't necessarily something that, that I could help them where it had to do with the lack of webcams <laughs> that, that were available. If you tried to buy a webcam, they were all sold out. So things like that, that was beyond the, 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 the support, the technology support. It was just the fact that there were no webcams out there. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, of that going on. So I was able to help a lot of my clients because the way that we set up and we support the clients is that we have them uh, uh, with support tools already in place and working remotely is, is, just, uh, as, is, is just simple because we're already maintaining their networks. Mm -hmm. So we were able to help a lot of the customers that way. On the flip side, there were a lot of people that came to us to help them that were not our customers. And that was the, that was the biggest challenge uh, just because uh, it takes time just to onboard a client and, and learn what their network is. So, but in the case of an emergency, it just, and then uh, for us trying to support the existing client, so that was a, that was a big challenge there. Uh, one 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 big challenge, obviously, is physical space. Right, nobody can go to the office, and I had several clients that were in the midst of an upgrade of a hardware refresh. In particular, because uh, Windows Seven uh, was end, end, end the support at the end of the year, at the beginning of the year, so there was a lot of projects already before the shutdown that uh, offices basically they needed to upgrade. So I had clients. I have a couple of clients that were in the middle of a purchase order to to purchase refresh or their you know a couple of computers in their office, and then the you know the shutdown came. So uh, they had a hardware that they already purchased. Uh, thousands of dollars in hardware equipment just sitting uh, because weren't able to go uh, on site and install them and set it up. So that was a, I had to be uh, extra flexible there and we did some arrangements with the hardware and kind of still waiting for, for a uh, scheduling opportunity to actually go and install that. But all these, all this time, uh, you know, that, that's been the challenge. Uh, we've been able to help a lot of the customers that are on the cloud using cloud desktops. Those are the simplest ones. My clients that were that have their cloud infrastructure, all their desktops are in the cloud. It's it basically not, they weren't impacted at all for uh, shutting down their offices because all their computers are already set up, and they in the same way they access the computer at work, they actually are accessing in the cloud. So those were the easy ones. And, so is that uh, words words to the wise: When in doubt, go cloud. <laughs> it's just like you know. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah. Good. Thank you. And could you pronounce the name of your firm? Because I'm sure I killed it. What? No, you, you actually did good. It's Hayon. Hayon Tech. Okay. Hayon Thank Tech. you. <laughs> All right. Um, again, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, Vince, tell us, um, can you tell us more about um, SBGC? I know, obviously, many of the folks on this call and the panel are, are well familiar with SBGC, but maybe some of the, some of the folks uh, out there are not. So if you could, um, if you could please, uh, Give some give some uh, a background on SBGC and um, and then I'll, I'll also ask you a little bit about the programs. I think there's a little confusion around the many programs that people <laughs> could apply to. Just so, tiny bit, <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> just a when bit. you're done, then we're going to ask uh, Eugene for some real life experience on the front lines of trying to process uh, many of those loans. So over to you, Vince. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you. And um, thank you, Jennifer, for putting this together and Joanne for that lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, the SBDC is uh, a partner in the community that is funded by the Small Business Administration. And we're a national organization of uh, private consultants that work in the public sector that help people to start, grow, turn around, or develop their businesses. And we have a lot of partners. Of course, SCORE is one. And uh, you know, all of the uh, layers of assistance are avail available to people, and we don't compete, we collaborate. And so therefore, what we do is to um, try to help people on a lot of business challenges normally, but during Hurricane Sandy, uh, and other disasters, the uh, center that serves Bergen County 
is a FEMA center as well as a disaster loan center. Our network is, is, is hosted out of Rutgers University. That's the master lead center in the state of New Jersey. And we have centers around the state. Here in Bergen County, we are hosted at Ramapo College of New Jersey. And it is a, a really great place to be. It's, it's, it's experiencing record enrollment this year when other, other institutions are struggling for students. Um, and that's really what helped fuel our student intern program. Uh, that is made up by presidential scholars and dean's list students that we can help deploy for people. But the SBDC and has a number of consultants that deal with a lot of vertical specialties. So we're there to help you in um, developing either financial analysis. We can, we can help you in um, developing um, cash flow analysis, break-even analysis in what the new normal would be. We can help restructure current debt, which is generally a difficult thing, but within COVID, even more challenging because our forward projections are no longer certain. And if you have to restructure something, rather than allow for the problem to really build and build and compound, we have an arrangement with corporate turnaround and Joanne was very kind to have helped posted that information on the county website because they have a number of employees that are helping triage some of the financial issues with us in order to help people to restructure. And then if people had trouble finding a bank, we have an arrangement with a, another company, Betterfin, that we can help track and supervise where they help find banks that would take on that program. So I guess I went right into the solutions. <laughs> the scope of what we do is that we counsel about 4,700 clients, um, uh, clients a year statewide, and about 1,000 of them are already in business. Um, and about 3,800 businesses received about five hours of counseling across the state. And so we, we have about 490 training sessions statewide, and we work with people to get SBA guaranteed uh, funding to the tune of about between 90 and $127 million statewide. So this is all stats before COVID. So our challenge now is how do we find that new normal? And we're there to try to help find solutions. And that's kind of why I went directly to the solution that people have on their mind now. And whether it's now or later, I could discuss what some of the uh, issues are when people get denial letters on the PPP program or the EIDL. Now we know the PPP was for payroll and the EIDL was for payroll and other things. And Pat, you mentioned the confusion. So there is an overlap. Now we can't double dip, but the payroll portion is designed to be forgivable because we want to protect the employees and we want to try to get people back to work here in Bergen County. And therefore, if people need assistance on either an initial application that was denied getting an application in. And as Pat mentioned, the PPP still has $129 billion left. So there is opportunity to apply for that program. In addition to the county program, there is other programs that are um, out there and the normal SBA guaranteed loan programs are still in effect. But what we need to do is apply for the right thing for the right reason to help the business recover in the right way so that we don't get in a situation where, uh, you know, we're borrowing all this money and then we hit a brick wall. We need to redo our financial projections. That boils down to a business plan. So the part of the question of um, what is a difficult client? What was the most difficult thing? The most difficult thing is to work with a client that doesn't seek the no cost services that are out there and lets the problem compound into you know, a further disaster. And the longer that we wait, the more difficult it is to climb back to ground zero. So that might be the best way to address what we do and that question. Moving forward, I don't wanna to take too much time, but uh, that might answer a bit of the question. A bit. 
Stevens. I, I was also going to make a, a comment. Um, you know, I, I was getting preparing today for uh, for for the the program, and I took a look at. I saw your video, by the way, for on the SBDC. And one of the things I was interested in. I um, I'm a. I, I don't think you're ever an ex market researcher or researcher. It's in the blood forever. It's in the DNA. So anyway, but I went out, I was very interested in the industry uh, data that was out there on the SBDC net. And I was really impressed with the recovery industry by industry, the resources that were out there for people to be able to go in and look industry by industry, the things that they need to consider. So I'm um, just going to give kind of a, you know, a shout out basically for the SBDC net and for those uh, the industry resources for the COVID recovery. Um, yes. <clears throat> Thank so you, Pat. That is a no cost resource. SBDC mm -hmm. net is a no cost resource for uh, SBDC clients. And as uh, you correctly mentioned, to get that data, one would have to have a lot of library skills. And in order that we make under Pre President Carter's original plan for the, SB the SBA, to make resources available to small businesses that only large businesses could afford, we put on these programs that help get industry analysis, a sample of business plan, local data analysis, market research, and a number of, uh, a long list of things available, all at no cost, and the librarians do it for you. And you get, we get PDFs back and we then supply it to the clients. It's incredibly and, valuable, Vince. I, I, sorry to interrupt you, but I, um, I wanted to move on, but it's incredibly valuable and I'd encourage anybody here, regardless of what industry you're in, you can find a resource out there. So as you're going back to take a look at the business plan, and as Vince says, there, there are templates, if you will, by industry, if you're gonna go back and revisit your business plan, some of the data that you, need, you may need to think about. So um, thank you, Vince. Let me segue over. So, um, Jean, you've been on the front line, or at least you, the bank has been on the front line. So can you talk for a bit about, um, clearly, the, the challenge to me would appear to be the, just the pure volume. Uh, and I guess that by way of intro, um, I'll steal your thunder a little bit, but I'd like mm -hmm. you to talk about it, which right. is the, one of the, the things that we encountered, at least with SCORE, is that a number of our clients were having a hard time finding a bank if they, their current bank wasn't taking applications um, to find another bank that would take the application. So um, finding, a, a, and you shared earlier that you guys were not just processing the, the loan apps uh, uh, for uh, your customers, but for new customers. So could you tell us a little bit about, because that seems to be one of the greatest challenges and tell us how you help folks. Yeah, of course. Um, first, I just want to say uh, thank you, Pat. Thank you for that. And um, first, I just want to say I'm honored uh, to be here. Um, thank you, Larry and Jennifer, for setting this up. Uh, conversations like this, are extremely, extremely important, right? For um, not only the business owners, um, but everyone in the community that needs to figure out how to access services, right? Whether it's, it's funding, um, you know, whether it's PPE, it's extremely, extremely important, especially during this time of COVID where we can't get together in person for us to, to get together in these types of forums. So thank you to, to the TNEC Chamber. Uh, thank you for organizing this. Um, it is, it is extraordinarily, extraordinarily important, and I'm, I'm honored to be here um, with such impressive business leaders um, to have this conversation. So thank you again for that. Um, so yeah, so Pat, to answer your question, to, to jump right in, um, Cross River Bank is a little bit unique. Um, we're very, very proud for, you know, first and foremost, we are, we are a community bank, um, you know, but we are, all, are also a technology company. Um, and we were founded, you know, our roots started in TNEC, um, right there, right on, um, um, you know, right on, um, right at the heart of TNEC, right across the street from the, you know, from town hall and the, and the police precinct. Um, we have a, we have a, a branch. That's our, that's actually our only branch. We were founded about 10, 10 years ago, right during the, the financial crisis. Um, and at that time when we started, uh, we had, eight employees. Uh, since then, we've grown to about 350 employees for a bank that's still, um, relatively speaking, that's tiny, right? Uh, the bigger banks like Chase and Wells Fargo and Bank of America, they have 350,000 employees. Um, and I think that that speaks to, to the significance of, of what we've been able to do 
Um, and really, it's all the credit goes to our, our CEO, who is, who is you know, brilliant enough to start looking at technology and making sure that we built our technology really, really early on, right? We started investing into our, um, into our backend systems to be able to partner with some of the nation's uh, coolest technology companies, um, both in the, in, the, in the lending space and the payment space. Um, we have some pretty interesting partners um, and have been able to, to serve, to serve uh, customers uh, through those relationships, um, make banking, banking easier, um, and at the same time, extend access to credit. So, you know, that, that's our traditional business. Um, you know, as the COVID uh, pandemic happened, um, we had to turn uh, the, the battleship. I mean, it's a, it's a relatively small battleship, right? 350 employees is, is tiny for a bank. Um, but very, very early, early on, um, uh, basically every, every employee at the bank got repurposed and we decided that we were going to very aggressively uh, participate in the Paycheck Protection Program uh, to serve as many small businesses as we can. Um, our CEO basically gave us a mandate. Look, it doesn't matter what the loan size is. It doesn't matter, you know, if it's a sole proprietor, a nonprofit or a big corporation, we're going to treat everyone equally and we're going to we're going to make sure that we're, we serve as many businesses as we can. So uh, through a lot of uh, technology partners, we um, built a, a, a program and uh, took on a, a quite a bit of loans. Um, there's, there was just a, a New York Times article um, written about us uh, last week. Um, and, uh, you know, in, the, in there, it was shared that we, we did over 100,000 loans. Um, it's, it's probably a little bit more now. Um, and those loans uh, we did for non-existing clients, right? We saw, um, you know, uh, as soon as the program was launched, people were really, really struggling. If you were a small business, if you, you know, didn't have a, you know, if you didn't have a relationship, if you didn't have a lot of money, um, a big deposit account at a bigger bank, it was really hard for you to, to access, access a banker, to access a bank, to, to you know, uh, get PPP funds, right? And and for us, we saw that as a, as a huge problem. So we opened our doors to, to everyone that wanted to apply. Um, since then, we've been able to serve um, 100,000 businesses. And we, we actually um, were the fourth largest in terms of um, the, the amount of volume in the country. So, you know, up there with the big guys, you know, um, some of the bigger banks. Um, and for a bank with 350 employees, that's, that's, that's really significant. Um, so very proud, um, you know, we were able to serve a, a lot of people. And um, the best part is we had the nation's lowest average loan size. So our average loan size was, uh, was about 40,000. Um, we, you know, compared, you know, compared to, to some of the other banks, we were the next, the next closest loan size, I think was like 60. And the one after that was about 100. Um, so we, 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 you know, made a significant impact and we're, that's what we're most pr proud of is the, the smallest businesses that we were able to help get, get to the program, right? The sole proprietors, the independent contractors, the nonprofits that, that just couldn't go anywhere else. Um, and, you know, we couldn't do that without the support, obviously, you know, TNAC has been great to us. It's been our home. Um, New Jersey has been great to us, all of our elected officials or, uh, you know, the local community groups that that have been been with us throughout the years. Um, without without that, we we certainly wouldn't have been able to to get to where we are. So um, you know, very proud of what we've been able to accomplish, and you know, obviously very proud that we started our roots here in New, here in New Jersey and here in Teaneck specifically. Um, I just wanted to I wanted to say, um, look, we are more than available and accessible. Um, you know, now that the program looks like it's going to be reauthorized on Monday, um, we plan on taking, you know, taking more loans and opening up the portal again for you to apply. If you are having issues, um, please don't hesitate to contact me directly. Um, I will share my email actually in the chat box, um, you know, uh, right now. So that way you can, you, you know exactly where to, where to contact me. Um, I can help you if you, if you have any problems, you know, if, if you have a question on eligibility, please don't hesitate. Um, the program has a pretty large scope um, in terms of eligibility. Um, I mentioned nonprofits a couple of times, independent contractors, um, small businesses, businesses up to 500 employees, and it's got amazing terms, like very, 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 very good terms. Um, and um, it's, you know, if you spend the money appropriately, and I, I know 
SBDC has, uh, so it has some great resources to guide you along the way in terms of doing that. Um, if you spend the money appro appropriately, it's, it's fully forgiven. So it's something that you should absolutely take advantage of. Um, you know, don't let the opportunity you pass you by the, the program. Um, it looks like it's going to get reauthorized. We're just waiting on a, on a signature from the president um, until August 9th. So, and there's still a hundred billion left. So please, please, please don't hesitate. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the story of what, what Cross River was able to do through the Paycheck Protection Program and very proud of it and uh, looking, looking forward to, to continue the conversation. And um, anyone that needs help, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thanks so much, Eugene. I was just going to say no good uh, deed goes unpunished. Unpunished, right, exactly. <laughs> that's can okay. I, can, I, can, I just say, can I just say something? I'm sorry, this Lynn. is Lynn talking. Um, so first of all, Eugene, thank you and your team I can't even imagine how 350 people, um, some of whom probably were not qualified to process these loans. So like the 12 of you who were, how you did that, because every banker I know like never slept for months. Um, but you make such an interesting point and I just want to like lift you guys up. Um, but I also, and at the same time, lift up the other local banks in our community because every single nonprofit house of worship, I don't know too many business people, but I think them too, who got PPP uh, paycheck protection loans in the first round were organizations who banked with somebody locally, who knew them, and who held their hand through the process. I filled out for my organization, I had to do the paperwork three times and somebody would call me every day. It's a new application or it has to be on this letterhead or whatever. It has to be January to December, 2019. They would call me and, and each time it was like six minutes, right? But they walked me through it. And for my organization, we're very small million point two budget. So to get $178,000 in PPP money at the, at, uh, at the end of April was the difference between laying off people, furloughing, closing our doors. I don't even know what fate um, represented. And everybody that I know that tried to do their applications through their big bank or their national bank, it didn't happen. And so I know the banking industry and there are probably bankers on here and I'm really sorry if I'm, if I'm blowing up your industry, right? But, but there is something about um, local, banks, right? local banks, banks and, and community banks and banks who are invested in your community and who will hold your hand and put all your people on, on it. And so for those organizations, you know, small solo practitioners, small businesses, faith communities, small nonprofits who were intimidated by the process or got kicked out the first time around because you banked with a national bank who was prioritizing their multi-billion dollar clients, I have to say, don't be afraid and jump into this fray because I'm a person, you know, I know that Bergen County is the ATM of New Jersey and New Jersey is the ATM of the federal government. And it's, and I'm very pleased that this money is flowing back into Bergen County and flowing back into New Jersey, but we have to make sure we get it. Yep. And, um, and so, so thank you Cross River for doing yep. what you did wherever you were doing it because it was, a, it, it was intimidating and it was a little bit scary and most of us who have to do this paperwork, this is not our expertise, right? I run a nonprofit, I'm a do-goody girl, right? Like I don't sit down with payroll and all these other things. Okay, and, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> So I'm really, yeah, Thank so, you. so Thank jump you into that. that. Yeah. Your and, enthusiasm's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and don't be afraid. Me. Don't be afraid. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. That really means a lot. Of course. So let me go over two things. Number one, there was an answer to a, a question earlier about the PPP. So um, Jennifer posted this. FEMA has a, great pro, a grant program um, 
So you should have seen that posted. You can take a look at it. Um, uh, the information on that, a uh, grant program for PPE costs through New Jersey OEM and Bergen County uh, and Bergen County community, uh, community developments considering paying for PPE costs for nonprofits and municipalities. I'm not sure that tells you where to find the equipment, but at least you can find out how to fund it. Hopefully they can go to sources. Uh, and then there's a question for Eugene here. Um, if a business uh, got a PPP loan from a different bank, but feels that they should, they should have qualified for a larger amount, is there an opportunity to make some kind of supplementary application through Cross River? So you are only allowed to have one, one application with uh, the SBA. Um, it, it depends on when, uh, when that loan was, was, was uh, put into the SBA system, um, when it was actually funded. Um, it, it really, every, every situation's um, unique. Uh, I, would, I would, you know, invite them to reach out to me and I, could, I can certainly troubleshoot that. Um, it has been it has been difficult to 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 do that um, because of the kind of the, the pure volume and and uh, everything else that that has happened with the program. But yeah, I I'm more than happy. I shared my my contact information with Jennifer and Jennifer, if you could just uh, send that out uh, and for them to reach out to me, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to them. Great. So hey Jennifer, can you take off your moderator ears for a minute and put on your uh... <laughs> <laughs> your consulting years, uh, and can you answer? You know, tell us. Uh, you know, tell us a bit um, about um, uh, about your experience. So I, t I talked a little bit about what were some of the more challenging, you know, experiences. Um, but can you um, can you actually um, address some of the maybe some of the um, uh, some of the some of the areas where you had with your clients that were the most challenging, and how how you were able to help them. Absolutely. So to answer that question, you know, one of the biggest problems that so many small businesses have is we get hung up on the little things and don't focus on the big things. We don't focus on the things that really differentiate us from our competition. We don't focus on the areas that really are going to drive people to our business. Instead, we focus on, well, if I hang this color, it's going to look better. You know, at the end of the day, is somebody really going to care if you have a white window or a green window or a red window? Probably not. It's not going to make the difference in terms of them going to your site, to your store, to your business, whatever it is. What you need to do is you need to find that differentiator that uh, stands out. Like Eugene was saying, with 300 plus people at the bank, getting the PPP, the lowest um, average uh, loan amount that went through with the highest amount of applications, there was a reason that people were going across river to actually do that uh, loan application. It's really important when you look at your business to do that. And one of the biggest challenges, it's not really necessarily just COVID related, but it's more so COVID related because in the age of COVID, when you can't have people going out and mingling and in the age of social distancing, how do you have everybody wanting to use your business? talking with clients, talking with people, and helping them understand that you need to really come up with that differentiator. You need to have what it is that makes you the only logical choice for somebody to go to in business. And that's where it really starts coming down to it. You know, if I go out there and um, Vince, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember if we were discussing this before the program started or you mentioned it during the program, but you know, businesses that have a USP, a unique selling proposition that is, I'm the only provider within a 100 mile radius. That's a great USP, but the problem is that it's easily breakable because if I go in and I say, well, I'm going to make a business and I'm going to say it's now 20 miles away, that 100 mile radius no longer is valuable. You need to have the guy who now says, I am going to make it pain-free, easy, hassle-free, whatever it is that's going to make it easier for you. But not only in that regard, it's got to be even more downright um, specific. You know, one of the clients I'm working with, he is uh, doing financing help for clients. Nothing against the banks that are on the program, but he offers financing solutions. And the problem was, why would somebody want to work with him instead of anybody else? 
And that was where we had to figure out how to make it work, especially now in the age of COVID. Uh, retail stores, restaurants, same kind of idea. What do you do that's going to separate yourself? Are you making your restaurant the only one that offers this particular food or are you just another restaurant that's offering the same kind of food as everybody else? So that's the way that you wanna start thinking and uh, make it stand out for you um, as we continue to move forward. Great, thanks Jen. I'll come back to you with another question a bit later. Um, let me go around and see who, um, if we hit everybody at least once. And by the way, I was going to share with you, uh, let's see, where are we going? Fernando, yes, I hit the question with the, uh, the webcams. <laughs> so I was right in there with everybody else trying to find a webcam where the cost didn't at least go up 50% if you could even find them, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, they were scarcer than hen's teeth. Um, let's see. The, um, I think when I think we went around to everybody got caught at least once. If I missed anybody, I think we grabbed everybody at least once. Um, I guess another one, uh, let's take another perspective because I think we talked about, um, I guess what I'd like to say is, so this is fine. You talked about how you helped your clients. Talk about how you were impacted as a business. Again, whether you're a nonprofit or whether you're a, uh, you know, a for-profit, um, how you were impacted and how you adapted. And, and I'll start out, um, certainly I'll just talk about SCORE. Um, we were mainly doing face-to-face, -face, you know, mentoring, right? Um, and in fact, some of the, you know, the ways that, you know, everybody has metrics, so uh, we have metrics too. And a lot of the ways that we did things uh, were face-to-face. -face. We did a lot of workshops, one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring, and people had to shift. Um, because it's a score, most of the mentors are, I would say, well, I'll confess, uh, you know, retirement age or greater. I'm one of the people who didn't retire until I was 70. I worked for a firm where I traveled the world. So I used to laugh. My friends would ask me when I was going to retire. And I said, when my corporation stopped sending me on these nice free paid vacations around the world. So anyway, but, but the point is that a lot of people were not as used to technology. I mean, I work with data and analytics and technology, but a lot of our uh, mentors were not. So people, number one, had to shift to using, you know, um, using uh, mobile, not just mobile technologies, but to use video conferencing. Um, uh, so, and, um, so shifting that mindset and even getting the clients to do that. Um, I volunteer, I, I teach ES, ESL and I just signed up for a program for project literacy and uh, people really wanted, they wanted ESL tutoring, but again, it was all face to face. So, you know, I shifted to doing and I've been working with a young uh, physician uh, who's studying for his boards, um, but needs to improve his, uh, you know, his English skills. So anyway, those are just, I thought I'd share some of the things both from a, you know, from a personal example where I'm doing some mentoring, uh, you know, in, in the community uh, and another one, which is more, you know, small business oriented, obviously through SCORE. So maybe we can go around and talk to some others and talk about how you, um, you know, how you shifted. Uh, and by the way, I do training. So I've been creating my own video. Uh, my book, I have a course for my book. I am delivering that now uh, in Asia but delivering it via a taped program. So I had to, you know, up, up my game and figure out how to create a video version uh, uh, of that training. So um, why don't we uh, kind of go around. Um, James, you wanna uh, hit it and talk about what you've been, um, how did you uh, adjust your business? Sure. Well, to be honest, I, I didn't have to adjust much. I've actually, been working exclusively from my home office for the last two years. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, I think it's probably been more of an adjustment for my client base than for me. Because, you know, you, I, I try to encourage people to interact virtually as much as possible, but you still have those clients, particularly uh, those who are older, they still like to see you in person, do a personal handoff. So they've become more receptive to either, you know, sending stuff by email uh, or, uh, or delivering by hand. Like I have a, I have a mail slot. I say, and then some people come and they go, I don't want to come in. I just, I just want to hand off. Uh, so I've, I've been doing um, some, using some technology. I've actually had 
uh, meetings to review tax returns with clients. I have have one client, she's, uh, I guess, her late 70s, is actually getting her daughter to come down from Rockland County to Manhattan to deliver a package to me tomorrow. Uh, you know, I got people who are learning how to scan an email. I have people who are taking pictures of not, 97 pictures, <laughs> for, one for each page of their tax return. I love that. Yeah. Um, but it's actually, you know, it hasn't been much of an adjustment for me in, in, in that regard. Okay. All right. Well, that's fine. <laughs> so, uh, so Joanne, you want to talk about how about what's been happening with, with, uh, with you and with the, with the county? Um, well, I just wanted to say something about the footprints in office because I've been speaking to some of the commercial brokers in New Jersey, mostly some in New York City. And when we're talking commercial brokers, I'm saying like 50 to 100 to 200,000 square feet. The fear was that businesses were going to abandon ship, right? Because now everybody can work from home. So what does this mean for all of our rateables and our real estate? Um, the good news is that a lot of companies are reporting that they are keeping their footprint. If anything, what they may be doing is buying smaller ones throughout. So if you're a Manhattan firm, you're Morgan Stanley, you're going to take a smaller footprint out in New Jersey and maybe Connecticut, Long Island. Um, we don't feel or fear, I should say, that there's going to be a mass exodus. And that's good news because everybody, you know, initially was worried. That's a very big problem in uh, Paramus and Hackensack. There's so much building going on. I don't know if anybody on this panel has driven on Main Street lately in Hackensack, but wow, Easy. there's about 1,300 <laughs> developments going up right now. So we really were in such a huge height. And I, I made a joke not that long ago that uh, I had an interview with like New Jersey Business Magazine right before, like, I think it was around March 3rd or something like that. And the, the name of the article was Bergen County's Dreams Come True. And it was pretty ironic because the whole article was really about, you know, how well our unemployment rate is and how low our vacancy is for the warehouse industrial space. We were at record lows. It was below 2% in some areas. So it's just been such a massive, massive switch. And we're all worried. Nobody really has answers. The best thing that I can do in my role is to get on the phone and sort of talk to, you know, the brokers and the business community as best I can. It's like I said in my example earlier, the county executive wanted to get to a group that really felt that they didn't get a fair shot at it. And I kind of do the same thing. I'm picking up the phone and just calling up the C.B. Richard Ellis's and the Jones Lang and all those folks and saying like, what are your clients telling you? What are your tenants doing? And I have to say from that perspective, it's been good news, good news. So we'll yeah. see. And you know, on a positive note, there are you know, more instances, I guess in every bad and awful situation comes something, you know, change is, is positive. So people have had to pivot and that's like the best and biggest term being used out there right now. But now, you know, more people are going to be working out of their homes. That's not a terrible thing. Our roads and bridges really don't need the wear and tear are going to be better. And I don't know if any of you recognize, but the sky to me looks gorgeous every single night. So I think that there's some good stuff, not to mention the fact that you're spending more time with your children and your pets. I mean, so I think when we do go back to whatever it is, whatever we want to call it, there'll be a hybrid of all this stuff. And it really will benefit the environment, families, and some other groups in the interim. I think it will. I think so too. Uh, Lynn, how about, you want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, I, and I totally get what you're saying, Joanne, but I also think we really, we cannot forget that there are many households where the safest place for children is to be in school every day. Yes, yes. Right? And, um, and I don't know if you guys are watching whatever some Florida university was like, you can't work and, you know, like you can't work and have kids at home. Like, so uh, there are the inequalities in our community, um, even here in lovely Bergen County, are really stark. They have always been stark. Um, I think COVID is making a lot of us who might not have been aware of it before more aware of it, mm -hmm. but it's always been here. And there are a lot of people who need to work and who have to work and for whom there are jobs, 
but their jobs require them to show up. And if their kids aren't in school, they can't show up or the choices that they have to make are really stark. So, um, so really have to, we have to understand our economy from soup to nuts here in Bergen County. Um, and, uh, and I just, I just want to, I, I just want to lift those people up because they're not always on these calls. Um, and, and I just want us to recognize that, like, those are the folks that I hear from, right? right. Like, if I, you know, if the camp doesn't open up, I don't know what I can do because I, like, what do I do? How um, so, do yeah. Lynn, that's really the question, right? So Say that again. My question, the question is, how have you adapted within COVID, how have you adapted your business or your services, right, to help your clients? So how have you adapted them? Well, we've, you know, we've made sure that people knew what resources were available, right? Because Bergen County is a really hard place to get information sometimes, right? And, and, and where the resources come from isn't necessarily like self-evident, right? right. So we've been a huge uh, repository of information to then push back out into the community. So better uh, communication? Sorry. Better communication is huge, right? It's huge. Um, uh, easier access uh, for, for all sorts of people, I think, is significant. And, um, and you know, Honestly, kind of holding people's hands, right? And, and, and making sure, like one of the first things that we did in the shutdown was to figure out how are school districts distributing free and reduced lunch and breakfast yeah. to kids in the shutdown right. and creating a, a Google sheet that we shared widely so that if anybody didn't know or if any town or any school district hadn't actually developed a plan, mm -hmm. we, quite honestly, I don't mean to say it in this way, but we shamed them into developing a plan so that at least those families could access those meals that were essential to their kids' survival. So. You know, it's uh, right. Information is power. Information is power. That's good, Lynn. I, had a, I, I have a couple of nonprofit clients, and uh, uh, one of my clients said, you know, the first thing that they needed to do, they couldn't address their normal needs, was make sure that those people got food, right? They, they yep. just shifted their, you know, their mission to make sure that they attended sure. to the immediate needs, you know, of their client base, yeah. right? So, right, absolutely. Um, they just shifted. Um, so, um, how about on the tech front, Fernando? Well, uh, for me, my business is, um, the way that I've adapted, uh, as soon as the shutdown hit was trying, I, I offered, uh, as an example, one, one thing that I did was I offered, uh, all of my clients and also non, non, non clients, so online meeting solutions, uh, <laughs> similar to zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, the rush of getting online and, and uh, so Zoom was a, was a big option at the beginning and it still is, but I offered that for everybody and I still am during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That was one thing, as well as uh, being more flexible than I was already uh, flexible with payments. Right. Uh, and uh, in, 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 I was in the middle of acquiring, you know, I had clients or potential clients in the pipeline that you know, the conversation all of a sudden stopped. Uh, and so for me to try to get those new clients, I actually did get new clients. Uh, but, I, you know, was more flexible in terms of the, the agreements. And um, so that, that, that's mostly how I adapted. Um, the security wise, my, my text, uh, we, our help desk was, they're all, they're all remote. So that, that, that they weren't affected in that way. But in providing the cybersecurity, that was a big challenge because working from home, the security that you have at home is yeah. non-existent compared to what you should have at, <laughs> at the office, right? Yeah. So we yeah. have to be flexible and try to uh, help the, our clients uh, get up to speed in terms of security with within their homes. Right. So we, we address that issue as well. Okay, thanks, Larry. Appreciate it. Um, sorry, Fernando. Somebody's name is right. Larry's name is right below yours. <laughs> so, thank you.
Um, let's see, Jennifer, tell us what, um, <coughs> from your perspective. So in terms of what has changed, um, obviously the force to go on over to virtual events and Zoom has definitely been a major thing. I used to be all over the place speaking and um, that obviously has changed dramatically from the in-person to the virtual events. Um, and I have been doing so many more uh, programs. I know like Joanne, as an example, was on one of my programs I did about a month and maybe a little more than a month and a half ago. Um, just to help businesses get more of an idea in terms of what it is that they can actually do to know how they can improve what they're dealing with. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things along those lines. I know that one of my divisions has definitely suffered a significant decrease in revenue. Uh, you know, I, one of the other lines that I do is payment processing and because businesses were forced to close, they weren't accepting any money. And so whatever I was earning on that side came down. So it's definitely caused me to make those pivots. And that's what I've also been showing people. If you don't properly pivot in your business, then what are you going to do? The problem is so many people think, you know, before the shutdown, I have a retail store. People are going to be coming into my shop. I don't have to worry, right? Even if they had the right... <clears throat> Uh, quote unquote market dominating position, which is that thing I mentioned earlier that separates you from your competition. But if you don't pivot and you look at how you get online, how do you uh, change how you're doing business, it's going to dramatically change what you're doing. One of the things that I always coach my clients with is when you start figuring out what your roadmap is to figure out where do I want to go, put down five to seven strategies so that you can get where you want to get to because you don't know which strategy is going to work and which strategy won't. So rather than having a brainstorm all over again, mm -hmm. you have five to seven strategies up front that as soon as one doesn't work, you simply pivot and you change over to the other ones so that you can have that uh, much quicker turnaround. Yeah. So that's kind of one of the things that you want to keep in mind in terms of pivoting, because that's really going to be important as you move in business. And that was extremely important in terms of what I was doing uh, because I lost 70% of my revenue from that division mm -hmm. um, over those three and a half months when businesses were forced to be closed. And I still haven't seen a lot of it starting to come back just because they're starting to come back. And a lot of businesses, people are reluctant to still go in. Mm -hmm. So it's been causing issues to so think what you're doing um, in terms of that process. Right. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and as you said, if, if you have the time to do it up front while you're doing your original planning and, and thinking those scenarios through, right, rather than being in the middle of a crisis when you're really, frankly, so under the gun, you probably can't think straight, right, which is what happens to people, right? Um, so uh, let's see, um, Vince, when I, you know, how, how have things changed for at, at SBDC? Well, thank you. Um, I can just frame that in a way that um, I've been teaching as an adjunct in business for 31 years and I've been doing online learning for a good portion of that really starting around 2004. So having put together like academic advisement systems over IDLS mm -hmm. and uh, different older technologies, um, I kind of, uh, after Hurricane Sandy said that when we have another disaster, it really shouldn't impact us again. Mm -hmm. And so we were really set up in a way that uh, whether it was uh, WebEx or Blackboard or uh, Zoom, the mindset to be deployed in a remote way was really in our center plan already. And so the key, is that of course the clients coming in for service, even though we had that type of training in Sandy, um, you know, a lot of the clients were not ready to make the shift that easily, but I'm quite frankly amazed 
at how people that are more senior that you thought might have such a hard time have quickly uh, <laughs> come on board. And yes, the microphone is muted once in a while and maybe the camera's out of focus, but for the most part, people are pivoting. You know, they're doing the dance here and what to do in order to get back up. And uh, when it's your business, you're highly motivated to make it happen. And that's what entrepreneurs do. They see a challenge and they go for it and say, what's in my way and let's get around it. So, you know, I've seen a lot of enthusiasm as Joanne has in that people are not rushing out of here. Yes, it's a challenge. Yes, there's problems. And yeah, it's not comfortable. But you know what? We're getting it done. And uh, so I've seen people, uh, you know, jump onto calls I never would have expected to feel comfortable in Zoom or, or WebEx or whatever. So, you know, I think that it, it, it's a mindset that uh, if you have a good mindset to make it happen, you're going to get over those hurdles that are in your way. Now, that said, of course, um, yes, there could be equipment shortages and, and, and these kinds of problems. And, you know, we had a supply of webcams already. Uh, you know, so we didn't really have that problem. But if it's the phone, if it's the computer, and you know something, even if it's the park, uh, you know, I've recently had to meet somebody, you know, eight feet away in a park, you know, we make it happen. <laughs> if we do it, the challenge is there, the business is there, the work is there, you go for it, you make it happen. And you do what you have to do. Well, I have to change you, Vince, because I'm thinking I, I claim that half of uh, the oldsters and I'm, uh, you know, quote unquote, I have to say I'm in that age bracket, if not the mind bracket. <laughs> you can thank their grandchildren and their families for their exactly. family. <laughs> Zoom calls. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the other day, laughing. I'm, I'm in a book club, so we shifted our book club, and we're all in the building. I live in a high-rise building, but I was running Zoom calls, and I was ready to tear the hair out of my head if I had another person draft. I couldn't figure out how to click what? the button. Oh, right, exactly. and you know what I'm looking the forward camera? to? Right. Maybe like when things are, are are much more calm, and we can maybe sometimes laugh at this. I'm waiting for that bloopers reel. Oh God! That's oh. gonna be great. I'm sure. Like I know, Mike, me and my folks at work, we've had to rally like there's no tomorrow. And right before I came on this call, uh, Greer is on here too with me. My mic didn't work, and I was flipping, and she was trying to uh, get me in Teams. And I said, "What if this doesn't work? I, my kids aren't home. I can't get IT on the phone." So, and I literally put a sign on my front door that says, "Do not knock in session. Come back later." Because I've been on Zoom calls where the neighbors are calling me because kids are playing in the street and it's my basketball hoop. It's just like there's a woman on GMA this morning, and if you watch Good Morning America, you may have seen it, but she was literally fired because her children were were interrupting her broadcast and, and she was suing on it and fortunately yeah. the news was reporting on it. But I, not not to report on, on sad things, but like there's a tremendous amount of anxiety that comes along with all of this new way of doing things. And it's understandable. Everybody has to be flexible and lean in on this because it is so different. We are all learning. We're learning at different paces, but we're doing our best. My favorite line is we do the best we can with what we have and that's it. <laughs> So, Eugene, come on over to you. So, how it yeah. stage? It sounds like you guys were, you know, you were prepared. You guys had the technology, and obviously, you had, you know, had a tremendous leadership right at the bank, which is fabulous. So, you know, I talk about that all the time, or I have talked about it from a management consulting perspective, and it's not always there. And so, it's a pleasure to to hear that. Yeah. So first, but first, I just wanted to say, Joanne, if if that doesn't exist already, I think you should you should do it, or, or maybe pitch it to to <laughs> SNL. Can't wait to see it. Um, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, I can give you some good content yeah. from, from some of the webinars that <laughs> we I have all saved. Can. So yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll split the revenue when you when when it goes viral. Um, <laughs> so so yeah, I mean, look, it's it's it was difficult because the hours were were really long, right? Um, did you, you know Tuesday. It was a good example. Uh, just this Tuesday, um, that just passed. The we thought the the program was going to end, right? And you know, we found out really, really late in the night. We you know we were ready to go till till twelve midnight and try to get as many borrowers as we could. And we found out at, at about 11, 11 p.m. that uh, the program was going to get extended. So 
Um, the last couple of months, um, all of our staff has, we've really been working, you know, really long hours um, from home and balancing. Um, I couldn't agree with Joanne also more or on, um, I couldn't agree more on, on there's positives, right? It's great being, being at home and seeing your family. Um, but then again, there's the, the work-life balance that, that uh, needs to happen. And uh, for us, you know, thank God there was, there was a great purpose involved, right? I, I, uh, I, you know, thankfully it's, it's, for me, it's much better to be, to be busy than to, you know, not, you know, I have it better than, than most people, right. That, that are struggling and are unfortunately unemployed and, 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 you know, are on the front lines in terms of, you know, the essential workforce. So I, I really feel for them, um, you know, for us, it was difficult because we had, you know, we had to, to work long hours and we had to do what we do, what, what we needed to do to be able to, to get as many people in um, to the program. Um, but again, that was, that was really rewarding. Um, so no complaints on our end. Um, the, the other thing I, I really wanted to, to make sure that I touched on is, um, Cross River Bank, in addition to obviously the, the work that we do in our, our day-to-day -day business, um, we also are, are very involved in, um, uh, community efforts. Um, so we launched, uh, right before, uh, right before the, Right before the, the crisis, we actually were, were about to announce a, a program with Operation Hope. And, uh, you know, once the, the crisis happened, we, we took it all virtual. Uh, so we, we launched a fi financial literacy partnership um, with a, a great financial literacy nonprofit called Operation Hope. They do uh, work nationwide. And um, uh, since the, the launch of that program, we've been doing uh, consistent webinars. Um, in the beginning, it was it was strictly about COVID resources and you know what programs were available. We we did one with uh, Assemblyman Johnson that went really really well. Um, we did one with Assemblywoman McKnight um, and and other elected officials to to get the word out about resources. Um, and now we're we're starting to to transition a little bit into you know getting back to work and um, how else we could s support small businesses. So we have two programs coming up. Um, if you go to our our website at crossriver.com slash hope. You'll see on July 7th, uh, which is next week, we're gonna have a program um, called, uh, entitled Be the Boss. It's a, it's a free small business development workshop. Um, you know, it, we go through, and it's, it's all free of charge. Um, and uh, it's run by an amazing gentleman named Juan. Um, he, um, you know, does these programs and then he does individualized coaching uh, for us as well. So. You know, please, please, please visit our website at crossriver.hope. Uh, the one on the seventh is going to be focused on, um, you know, the, the, if you're a new business owner and you want to start up a new business or you're an existing business owners, owner, you know, the challenges that, that you know, you may face, uh, whether building a business plan, looking up, looking for startup funding, uh, getting that to that next stage of your business. So uh, that's a great resource I, I wanted to be able to share. Um, and then, that leads into um, a, a larger entrepreneurship training program, um, which, which begins, it's a seven week program. Um, it's a certificate program and it, that begins on, on July 14th. So I'd encourage, you know, you know, new small businesses, existing small businesses to, to join in and uh, take advantage of that resource. Again, that, that the, uh, you could find out more obviously by reaching out to me directly or going to uh, crossroad.com slash help. Okay, thanks for kind of leading them off. I'm just going to um, do a shout out to the attendees. Uh, just remember, we've got the chat room open. So if you have any questions that you'd like uh, some answers to, you can just post them in here. Um, we're, I'm going to do a sweep, basically, of the, of the panelists. Um, so I just want to make sure that we um, have covered anything that you want to, to cover in terms of um, services to make people you know, aware of. So whether it's upcoming um, webinars or uh, uh, anything else that you think um, that you want to uh, remind folks that you can help them with. So why don't we start with you, Vince? You're on my upper left-hand side right now. Okay, excellent. And talking about distractions, actually one did affect us. I gave you a wrong stat earlier. I said 1,133 clients statewide. Mm -hmm. It was actually um, uh, about 7,000. Uh, but um, the... Um, uh, the, the issue is that uh, capacity in a time of crisis is something that you need to upramp like immediately. And almost all the infrastructure when COVID hit wasn't 
really set for the high demand that we had on all of us at that time in public service. And Joanne has set really best practices in how to try to get out there and make contact and communicate to the community on a regional basis. And when that problem hit the SBDC, I reached out to the partners that I had relied on prior and that I knew and that are community people and Bergen County people. And, you know, we said, what can we do? Well, I uh, brought the challenge to uh, Ramapo College and they had a new provost, Sue Golden is our new provost, and said, listen, let's leverage what we've got. And I had full support to bring on the best of best students that were looking for internships. And I also have my Ramapo valedictorian that's part of my team now, Ryan Greff, that might be on the, uh, he's the number one student from Ramapo College that just graduated. In addition to my, and to our outreach person, Kathleen. So we're on the phone and doing this stuff around the clock and how do we build capacity? And the consultants I have now have augmented teams of qualified academically trained students that can help do the back end work for those stu- for those consultants and they could turn around and give more accurate and more qualified information to clients faster and more accurate and it is no cost to the client so we really you know said how can we do it you have to have top management support and we have it and now i have a team and we deployed it so if there is anything that I'm most proud of is all of the people and the consultants that I have had and that work with me that are really autonomously going out there and helping people as best possible because we can't do anything about what's in front of us and the challenge is there. It's a matter of now, how do we get through it? And, you know, the newest P4 actually will allow for two PPPs and these things are confusing. And, and there is a lot of programs out there, but someone has to have a human touch. And, you know, as James mentioned, some people just need to be met and talked to. So how do we get that communication capability up there where it makes an impact in the community and we get people back up and running and uh, get Main Street back? And, and it is absolutely um, uh, stellar what, what Eugene, has, what, what their group has accomplished in the PPP. But... In our layer, we have a lot of people that will not rate. And there's a reason for that, why we're turned down. That reason is what we have to peel the onion back further. And we have to figure what what are the cash controls that are not in order? How do we get those in order? What are the record keeping that needed to take place? How do we get that in order if it didn't happen? And then there's business model issues and there's other matters. And when people are turned down, it's not because the PPP program was conceived in darkness and is a failure. It's because people don't meet the criteria and we need to get people to meet that criteria so that it is a satisfactory process. And that is what we're building capacity to do with all of our partners. And uh, you know, that's, so I guess I I could, I could close on those comments, but uh, it's obvious from my team. We like what we're doing. We're there to help the best we can. And, uh, you know, our contact information is up there. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying our best to uh, provide as much solution as possible. Thanks. Uh, I'll put a plug in for SCORE. Uh, we switched to doing a lot of, uh, so not just uh, face to, you know, face to face, as I mentioned, and some of the just going virtual via conference call, but we took email questions from people. We, you know, our uh, motto is there for the life of your business, meaning we literally mean the full life cycle from ideation to, uh, you know, starting your business, growing your business, and if need be, retiring your business, right, or selling it. Um, but we, uh, we switched to, you know, being a bit more tactical because people just had questions they needed answers to, period, to help them, you know, think and fix things. And so uh, um, just to get a bit of a plug again that, you know, we're there, you know, just, just like SBDC is. And as uh, Vince mentioned, we're partners. You don't have to think of either or, you know, it's both. 
we refer stuff to one another, you know, based on, uh, you know, what's the best resource. For example, we don't go as deep into the finance area and we might help somebody to a certain level and then we would refer them over to SBGC. So, um, so just a plug for, uh, you know, keeping, um, keep, keeping score in mind, keeping score period. <laughs> so, um, so uh, Joanne? Um, I'll be brief. I just wanted to say that uh, there's in total 47,000 small businesses in Bergen County. When you think about that, that's insane. That's a humongous number. So every Monday I have a call with the Director of Economic Development for Passaic County and the Director of Economic Development for Hudson County and some of the other counties. And not only do we have the most municipalities, when, they say, when I say 70 towns, their jaws drop. But uh, for example, Passaic County was talking about their grant program and in total they have 12,000 businesses. And I said, we have 47,000. Mm. 47 is a huge number. So the scores, the SBDCs, the chambers and all the business advocates and resources and Lynn, your group as well, everybody and, and Eugene too, the, the banks. I mean, everybody's trying to do as much as possible and communication is so key. So if you have resources that you want me to blast out to my list of businesses, please send them to me. And if you have clients or companies that you work with that you want to tell them about this grant, please also give them my information and have them call me because of course your service is to help them. So the more we collaborate, the more we keep talking. And again, maybe one of the, the nice things that can come out of this is the ability to do Zoom meetings more often than in-person meetings because we're talking more. And it really is about that. Thanks, Joanne. Lynn? Um, I just wanna say anybody who out there who small business or nonprofit organization that wants to be part of a coalition for things like group purchasing or finding resources. Um, the Volunteer Center, I'm gonna wear my Volunteer Center hat uh, for a little bit longer, bergenvolunteers.org is there for you. And we're really good at combining uh, partners and coalitions to do things. We typically do it with nonprofits, but we could do it with others. Um, so I want to put Bergen volunteers out there and I'm very proud to have to be joining Greater Bergen. Today was my second day um, and Greater Bergen or First Bergen Federal Credit Union, which is a part of Greater Bergen is going to be implementing the um, is doing the back office work for the loan program that Joanne's been talking about today. I wasn't so, sure if I was allowed to say that. Yeah, it's OK to did. say it. I think I can I'm say really it. really glad right. you did. I did it. Yes. Though. And Great. so, um, yeah, and so, you know, the idea is to get uh, low interest loans up to $10,000 in the hands of, of what were deemed non-essential businesses in the first 100 days, but are completely essential to our economy. And so put the word out there, Bergen Volunteers, Greater Bergen, they're, like there are resources out there for you and, um, and, and I'm happy to direct you to whoever is the right partner to help you navigate through this. And thank you again for um, allowing me to be on this very illustrious panel, like as just the lowly nonprofit person. So thanks. We're a bunch of us are nonprofits. You're not I know, but you know. <laughs> Eugene? I'm a nonprofit too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, all, all jokes aside, um, you know, the, the bank not only, you know, not only does uh, a lot of work in the financial literacy space, but we also, um, you know, uh, have given a lot in terms of PPE. If that's a resource, I know, and if that's a need, I know that there was a, a question earlier. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly donating a lot of that as well. We've made that available to our employees, um, but also want to want to make that available to, to the larger community. Um, it's, you know, anyone that any, we've reached out to our local hospitals, obviously in, in, in Teaneck and, and, and broader um, and have, have done pretty large drops of, of uh, PBEs. But if, if there's any, anyone that needs, please don't hesitate to reach out to us as well. Um, that's another way that, that we could be of help. Great. Thanks, Eugene. Yeah. Uh, James, anything to add from your perspective? <clears throat> uh, uh, I had stepped away for a moment. What was the question? 
so I was just giving a roundup. So how can you help, oh. help folks? And I, and I think okay. uh, any comment to add around taxes and the impact of uh, the <laughs> delayed, uh, you know, tax filing. So it's now April 15th or July 15th, rather, right? From April. Mm -hmm. Yeah, July. Uh, so, you know, one, one thing I do is uh, I, I publish or distribute, I shouldn't really say publish, I distribute a monthly newsletter and a, a, a blog that's pretty much on a weekly basis is actually done by my website provider. I, I probably shouldn't divulge that because people, a lot of people think I, uh, I develop it myself. And, you know, there's been a lot of information in there. Like I just had one go out yesterday, the July newsletter about the PPP program and the various other grant and loan programs. And I, I get a lot of questions for those. These, these, these uh, communications go out not only to my clients, but to um, hundreds of other people. It, sometimes I'm a little, <clears throat> I'm interested in why people reach out to me, and these are business owners I'm talking about, instead of uh, their accountants, because clearly they, they must have accountants, but that's okay, I've actually, uh, provided assistance to people uh, through the loan application process. And actually, I wish that, I, I think that's one bit of advice I can give to people, especially business owners, is that you should speak to your accountant, assuming that you have one, before you apply for the loans. Like I have had people who didn't understand the formula and applied for the wrong amounts. Uh, some people got, I, well, some of them have been caught. Luckily, like one person called me and said she got like a uh, hundred thousand dollars. I was like, "That's that's more than the cap. Like, what's happening?" Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I'm dealing with some of that now. People who applied for the loans and didn't involve me, and now they want to know uh, how they should be paying themselves, what the forgiveness process is like, and and. and you know, not that I have answers, like when people ask me about the questions about, you know, PPP, I want, I said, do you want today's answer, yesterday's <laughs> answer, or tomorrow's answer? Yeah, 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 it it changes sometimes on an hourly the basis. The final guidance on this stuff is like a moving target, right? Right. Um, but, interim, uh, so. interim, interim final guidance. <laughs> <laughs> the SB, SBA has these IFRs that come out. <laughs> yes, almost on a daily basis. On a daily so basis, I, I, yeah. Well, they can sign up for your newsletter, right? Number one. They or can. Uh, secondly, you know, the, your advice probably to them is, you know, if you don't have an account, you probably should get one. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, this is true. So, um, uh, Fernando, um, some closing comments from you or last thoughts? Uh, sure. Um, um, you may recall that. Dur before the lockdown and probably the beginning of the year, one of the common headlines in the news that you heard was ransomware. Ransomware, municipalities being locked down, you, you, uh, universities being locked, being attacked by ransomware, hospital systems being attacked. It was all ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. So now when the COVID hit, now kind of the, the news is, uh, I have people asking me, I haven't heard about ransomware. Ransomware is still out there and it's still affecting thousands and thousands of businesses on an ongoing basis. So don't put your guard down with your cybersecurity. More now that people are working from home, you really want to make sure, you know, at the beginning it was a rush to get it set up, but you may have time to now think about what you have in place and make sure you protect yourself because any emergency, you could have a hurricane, you know, outage, you know, it, this can happen again. Um, so that's my, my suggestion is, you know, just think about it, you know, imagine yourself if you have, if you're living like, let's say in the 1980s or 1990s or whenever the crime was the highest and you're living in a house and, and it's a bad neighborhood, I'm sure in your house, you will, you will lock your door, put multiple locks, you will protect your, your family, you know, your, your car, you will protect it because you know, there's, there's vandalism outside. So imagine that back in the day. So imagine, so what's happening right now in your office environment and your home, once you plug your computer on the internet, the internet is well or wide. There is no section, there's no, there's no safe internet, safe section or block. It's, it's the world wide web. It's the wild, wild west. So in terms of, 
<laughs> or in terms of security, you once you plug it in and you're online, you're done. You have, you, you have to protect yourself the same way you would protect yourself physically if you were living in the, in a bad neighborhood, because the internet is is global. Okay, so, so Fernando, what does that mean? It means use a password protector, be on a VPN, and have some kind of um, security package installed. Yeah, there's there's a multiple say, security is a multiple multiple layers of security. The same Put on way your you have, mask. Yeah, yeah, there's multiple layers. Exactly, like same thing with safety, right? So it, it's yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we were having such a happy call, Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a question I just want to um, bring up. Somebody asked about, uh, Tamara asked about, um, uh, are they considering going to forgive every, everyone's loan under 100K due to the heavy paperwork for loan forgiveness? I don't think so. Tamara, uh, you can hope, but I, unless I, someone... I, I could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I could speak to that. Yeah, so we've actually been working. Um, so for the smallest businesses, uh, there is a... a a um, bill in Congress right now that was just introduced. It's actually uh, sponsored by our Senator, uh, Senator Menendez, um, to forgive the smallest uh, businesses. Uh, so businesses under uh, 150K, um, you know, to make it, to make it a lot easier. Um, there was a form, uh, the form was updated to make it, make it simpler now, uh, but they're, they're looking to, to make it even simpler than that um, and really forgive all those loans for, for the smallest of businesses, um, and that's something we've we've been advocating pretty heavily for. Uh, you know, those those businesses with, you know, independent contractors, and you know, the the ones that that uh, at first they had to they had to uh, you know kind of get into battle to just get the loan. Now they have to be in you know now they have to fight to uh, to get it forgiven. Um, we're trying to make it easier for those businesses, uh -huh. the smallest ones. Okay. So there is, there's hope, um, there's hope that it'll happen and it's got bipartisan support right now. So uh, kudos to our Senator for lead, leading that effort. Right, I misunderstood the question. So that's great, Eugene, thanks. Yeah. Um, so um, Jennifer, I don't know if you're, you're last, you might be second to last, I don't know if Larry wants to um, add anything um, before, I'd like you to maybe give you a chance to speak and then if Larry wants to, uh, to add in anything. Absolutely. So. Just a couple of things to just keep in mind. Make sure that you're ready to pivot, like I said before, no matter what happens. Um, we've seen that openings have been pulled back. We've seen that states are going through uh, significant increases in cases and they're expecting a second wave to hit, not to lend, have a down part or down point, but um, we definitely though have to be completely realistic. And that's one of the reasons why we've been having these kinds of programs. The chamber has been very involved, very much out there, uh, trying to help our small business community uh, get the resources, knowledge and uh, programs to help all of our small business members. So think about what it is that you need to do uh, in a few moments, I'm going to be showing the contact information that is going to be how you can contact all of our panelists uh, today so that you can get information in the event that you have any questions or if you have specific private questions that you didn't want to ask on the program, you can directly reach out directly. Everybody on this program today is an incredible wealth of information. We've got some amazing resources. The SBDC, SCORE, the county, uh, the Bergen, um, Greater Bergen organization. There's so much uh, here just in terms of the greater national organizations or the smaller uh, nonprofits. And of course, you know, our panelists, all incredible people reach out, take advantage of what we have uh, to offer because that's really what we're trying to offer you. And uh, Larry, I think I unmuted you. So if you wanted to hop in and come on screen. Yeah, there's really not much more that I can add that the panelists have already said. I think you've done a fantastic job. You hit just about every single issue. And I think it shows our guests that we are all working together. We are here. We're able to help. You're not being shoved off. You're getting personalized attention. 
So I sincerely hope that you take advantage of this and also spread the word to other businesses that you know. That's it for me. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry, for organizing this. No, that's actually all. Jenny has been the major push in this. I just, I guess, lit the match and everything exploded. And I thank everybody that participated. Awesome. Well, I can say I learned a lot and I'm, I'm really honored to have been on a panel with, with all of you and uh, happy 4th of July. <laughs> Thank you. Have a happy 4th. Well, as well. I should be seeing, by the way, the uh, panelist contact information. Mm -hmm. So if you're not, um, or if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out. Uh, keep up with the chamber. If you're not already following the TNEC chamber on Facebook, it's TNEC COC on Facebook. Uh, or email info at TNECchamber.org. Uh, definitely reach out to us. I am going also to uh, send out this uh, contact information uh, page to all of you uh, for attending. Um, we'll also be putting a replay of this uh, program available on multiple platforms. So if you are watching this on replay, I thank you very much for watching it. For those of you that are live, uh, thank you all so much for coming out today. Thank you very much for participating, for being involved. And on behalf of all of us, we want to wish you a very happy 4th. Enjoy your hot dogs, beer, whatever it is you're going to do. Just remember to socially distance. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you all again soon. Thanks, Thank Jennifer. you all. Thanks, Larry. <laughs>